What's going on everybody? It's Richard here and today we've got yet another car review. This time it's the X3M competition. Now some of you who follow me online you might actually recognise this car. That is because it's my old car. It's no longer owned by me. It's owned by my good friend Antonio who owns Malaga Tapas. So shout out Antonio, shout out Malaga Tapas for letting me borrow this car today. I've swapped him the SVR so he'll be darting about in that today in Glasgow. Now before I even start this video, I've got a huge amount of driving experience in this car. I owned it for almost about 18 months, which, ah, so much noise here. Which for me is a long, long time to own a car, like a real, real, real long time. I've done a lot of miles in this car, I've had a lot of fun in this car. And before we even get into the actual review, I'm going to make my bias very clear. This is one of the best vehicles on the road right now without a shadow of a doubt. If you're looking for this review to diss the X3M, or you hate it, or you want a reason to hate it, I am not going to be your guy. This is one of the best cars around. So let's have a look at the technical specifications and follow me over to the car just now. So as you can see, the car is wet. It's also very windy because remember, I'm in Glasgow in Scotland. We're currently underneath a motorway bridge to make sure we don't get rained on and we can actually do this review for you guys. So. I don't know why the X3M competition doesn't get as much credit as the M3 competition because they're pretty much the exact same thing. Me personally, I actually like the X3M more. I think it's a nicer shape, it's got more usable space. I just think it's a nicer car. So this car has the latest platform of this engine. This is a 2020 69 plate, but the engine's not really changed. We've got a bit more power out of it because if you know BMWs, you know that all you need to do is put a downpipe on this and tune it and the power is absolutely insane. This car's completely standard, by the way. It's never had any performance modifications in my ownership or in Antonio's ownership, so it's completely standard. The car comes with just over 500 brake out the factory, around about 450 pound-feet of torque. The latest engine platform is called the S58, so we've had N58s, B58s, all these different ones. And one of the really cool things about this engine, it's a straight six by the way, three liter straight six twin turbo, is that most cars timing systems are at the front. Timing systems are really complex. It's what allows the engine to run essentially. So you'll hear people talk about timing chains, timing belts. This car's timing system is actually at the back, meaning that if your timing chain was to break, it would be an absolute pain to fix. Apparently, this is the rumor, is that BMW's engineering team are so confident in the lifetime performance of this engine that they don't think it will ever need anything done to the timing system. And this engine comes fully forged from factory. Normally people who were putting out high performance BMW engines in the past, people who were tuning M140i's and M4's and M3's previously, you had to forge the engine. This comes forward from factory, meaning that there's cars, X3Ms in the UK, standard engines, stock internals. People have changed turbos and, and maybe meth injected them, but the standard rollout of that engine is running 900, 1000 brake horsepower plus, which is pretty crazy to think about. So I wanted to bring you around the back for a second, because in my opinion, the X3M has one of the most underrated and beautiful rear ends on the road just now. Personally, I love the colour on this car because I picked it. For the car heads, you'll recognise this is Porsche Miami Blue. It's actually tech wrap rolling C because this car is wrapped. Underneath the car is BMW Sophisto Grey, which is like a really, really, really dark grey. It's absolutely gorgeous. But you know me, I like bright colours, so that's why I made the car this colour. If we look here, we've got the beautiful quad exit exhaust. I think the diffuser is very simple and just absolutely gorgeous. The rear lights are stunning. The rear lights have really changed on the latest version of the X3M. And they're a bit ridiculous in my opinion. I think they look a bit tacky. In my opinion, this is the best version of the X3M. The great thing about this car as well is that it's full spec. and does not have an optional extra missing from this car. Sound system, seats, double sunroof, sports exhaust, you name it. It's got absolutely everything inside this car. No, mate, sorry, bro. <laughs> People make Glasgow. So the car sits on these amazing 21s. Me personally, if you know BMW wheels and you've seen the BMW kind of M Sport competition wheels, they're like these crisscrossed, highly spoiled wheels. I really don't like them. I never have liked them. I just think they're a bit goofy. I think these wheels are absolutely gorgeous. 
We've got the diamond cut finish, the black on them. I think that accentuated against the black finish on all the windows and the spoiler lid and even the blue and how the blue is not too glossy. I honestly think this is just one of the best cars that you can get ever. I literally cannot find the catch. Where is it? I can't find the catch. I've owned this car for like two years. <laughs> I've no idea where is it, it is. Not on the fucking that's what I thought as well. I just sold it to my mate and haven't seen it in a while. <laughs> I've already popped it, but let me try it again. Two-man job, bro. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Excuse the leaves. They were an added optional extra from factory. You pay an extra 10 grand, you get a collection of leaves from the BMW factory that they leave inside of the bonnet. It's good of them. Let's have a look inside and see the specs of the interior on the XDM competition. Now the XDM has a super, super simple, in my opinion, very classy and very well designed interior. You're going to see a lot of like carbon weave effect in here. You're going to see it along the dashes, along the doors and stuff like that. I always, before owning a BMW, minus the i8, bear in mind I owned the i8 and that is just like the most non-BMW BMW ever, right? The interior's like blue and stuff, it's just totally weird. I always hated BMW interiors. I always thought they were really, really poor. Me personally, having owned and driven quite a few performance Mercedes cars, before I'd ever had like an actual supercar like a McLaren or, or whatever, I was always a big fan of flat bottom wheel and stuff like that. That was just the design that I really liked because that's what you got with Mercedes. And I always just thought that BMW was really not that interesting until I first got in an XDM competition. And let me tell you how that happened, by the way, just a quick side story. I was down to see my friend Jamie Rooney from Godless Tire Centre. He was putting tires on a car of mine at the time. I can't remember what it was. And he had a, an accident damaged white X3M that was in after having an insurance repair on it and he was getting new tires. And I looked inside it, and you know the thing that caught me? If any of you have watched Too Fast, Too Furious, where they have the NOS buttons on the steering wheel, this has got its M1 and M2 buttons on the steering wheel, and I looked and I was like, oh, M1 and M2, because, ashamedly, even as a petrol head, I thought the X3M competition was fake. Like, I thought it was people up-badging their cars. So I didn't, I didn't actually realise that the X3M competition was a real thing. I thought it was people just getting an X3, like, two litre diesel and then going, oh, stick an M badge on it in competition underneath to make it look cool until I started seeing them everywhere. And I had no idea about these different buttons. I hadn't seen them on any other platform of BMW before. And after getting a little feel for the interior, whilst it was in Jamie's place, I thought, wow, I really want one of these. And I bought one a week later and, and brought it home and had that in my, and that in the McLaren and the AMG GTS at the same time. Three very, very different cars. Now, I fell in love with this steering wheel. The one thing... The one thing I wish, and I don't know if this is an option from factory, but I wish it was Alcantara. I'll be totally honest, I have really small, really soft hands. I've got hands like a woman. Driving this car, something I feel like I actually need to like grip a hold, especially if you're driving this with some, you know, vigour. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not the easiest car to control in terms of just holding the steering wheel, but in terms of the actual design and the buttons, I think it's absolutely beautiful. Now, the screen in here isn't exactly huge. It's not a big, massive screen. It's not got Apple CarPlay, which, by the way, I am not a huge wave into guys over there that came in and helped with the uh, the bonnet latch and watched the, watched the video getting recorded. The screen isn't massive, but one of the really cool things about the screen that loads of people don't know, and I only realised one day when I was wiping it, is that it's actually touchscreen. The screen is fully touchscreen. You can change the music on it. You can type on it. You can navigate it in any way using controls on the steering wheel or controls here on the um, little center console. Or you can just do it with your hands, which is really, really handy. One thing that this car has that the SVR doesn't have that I really miss is heads-up display. I'm a massive fan of heads-up display. I've had it on nearly every car I've had for the last five years minus having it in the SVR. So we don't have any heads-up display in the SVR. And I think, personally, that they really missed it a trick, Range Rover, by not having a heads-up display. So I like here, I can see the speed limit, I can see the speed that I'm going at, you can 
toggle some different features, but that's what I've always liked having. It's just my speed and my speed limit. As you know from what I said previously, I'm a massive fan of a physical gear selector. I really like a physical gear selector. I also really like this car being driven in an SMG style format. So being able to use it as a trigger up and down, just pushing it back and forward like a sequential gearbox. I find that really fun to drive. I am not a fan in terms of the X3M itself and also the SVR and other cars. I am really not a fan of the flappy paddles. I don't use the flappy paddles ever in this car. It's not something I ever really have used. The only car that I loved the flappy paddles in was the McLaren because they're huge. You can downshift and upshift with the same hand. If you've never watched that video before on my YouTube channel, go watch it. It's just, it's a really cool way to do the flappy paddles in that car that I don't feel this has the same oomph. When we get into driving this car, you're going to see that this has a really ridiculously high rev point before it changes gear in the gearbox, which can be a little bit annoying when you're driving it. But in terms of getting good performance out of it and kind of being able to really kick the car's arse a little bit, I don't think the flappy paddles really add that much for the average driver. Like I said already, this car's like full spec. Harman Kardon audio in the interior. The only car that I think that I've owned that has better audio is the Range Rover SVR. It's also got the double din sunroof in here as well. Loads of people actually think that this is like just like a kind of panoramic roof. They don't realise that it's actually a sunroof. Like, you just press it open, the wee thing goes back, and I think I'm doing this right. And then you just pop that open. It's actually a fully panoramic sunroof, which I'm not going to use today because it's bloody raining. So, this car has literally every single option. One of the things I also really love about the XDM are these bucket seats. They're wing-backed, they're super comfy, if you need lumbar support, if you're old geriatric and your spine's fading away, you've got it. Like, just everything about this car is really, really comfy. And it, it's not a chore to drive. I'm driving this car long distances and I've never felt like, oh, like, it's really uncomfortable. And it's funny, after going from the SVR back into this, I feel like I'm in a hatchback just now. I don't realise how big the SVR is, but this car is so small and so nimble. One of the things that I said to Antonio last night when I got home, after using the car, I was like, whoa, like the steering is so unbelievably light. I feel like I'm driving in a little go-kart, whereas the SVR, you're kind of moving this real big vehicle. The thing I love about the M1 and M2 buttons here, when you look at them, you'll realise that they're a sport mode type of thing. You actually program them to your own driving settings. And dare I say, I don't think Antonio's ever changed them since I've done them. So these will still be in my driving settings, I'm pretty sure. So if, if I press M1, that puts me into just a completely standard setting of efficient, comfort, and comfort. So that's efficient suspension, efficient steering, and efficient performance. If I press M2, it goes into its absolute most aggressive settings. So as you can see, the active exhaust is turned on straight away, and it's put me in Sport Plus, Sport Plus, and Sport Plus. The weird thing about this car being a light SUV, if you've watched my SVR review, you'll see... There's so many examples of different driving modes for that car. Snow, gravel, all these different things. Although the XEM is four-wheel drive, and let me tell you, if you're getting one to treat it like a 4 by 4 don't. It's so heavily biased to the real wheels. You'd be as well just driving an M4 or something, right? But this car has no driving modes whatsoever for off-road. It has a button you can press and a thing comes up and it tells you what degree you're sitting at. I've used that when driving off-road in this previously. And it's been capable, don't get me wrong, it's been fine. It's not, I'm not felt at any risk. But this car is, is not meant to be used as a SUV. It's not meant to be used for going and driving through snow and gravel and dirt and mud. This car is a sports car. Whereas something like the SVR is a 4 by 4 that has got a massive, ridiculous engine in it. So we put a huge amount of effort into our YouTube channel. We spent so many hours filming, editing, planning, week on week to make sure we get four uploads every single week to you guys. And sadly, more than 80% of the people that watch my videos actually don't subscribe to the channel. So if you're watching this just now, you enjoy the car reviews, all the business stuff, all the vlog stuff, all the travel stuff, whatever it is you like, I would so, so, so appreciate a subscription on this channel. It would be fantastic. It costs you nothing. You get amazing content. You're going to have a laugh. There's going to be a lot of stuff for you to enjoy. So please click the subscribe button down below and follow along for the rest of the journey.
In terms of storage capacity in here, you've got your normal little door storage and your centre console here. This little area here that actually has a wireless phone charger inside as well, so you can just sit your phone on there. Don't have your hopes up though, the wireless phone charger is terrible in this car. Uh, and every time I used it and I tried to pick up my phone, it was like holding a scalding fr like frying pan. It was just like not the best thing ever, so I would definitely recommend just using the USB. But in terms of actual space, this car, if you have kids, a family, if you're looking for something that's like really usable, really affordable, it just ticks every box in terms of speed and all that. Th this car is exactly it. it. It does absolutely everything. The Range Rover, I've already I've already made the exact same point. The Range Rover is so usable if it's a family car. This car is obviously still not great on petrol. It's, it's a performance car. It's never going to be good on petrol. But in terms of having something, like you could probably get one of these now. Not when I got mine, but you could probably get one of these now for somewhere in the region of £40,000, maybe full spec this has only got twenty six thousand miles on it it's not got a lot of miles like this car is a car that you can get for a really really good price and they finance really well i was paying somewhere in the region of 500 pounds a month when i had this car so if you're someone who is on a decent salary or you're doing not too bad in your business you don't want to get a super aggressive sports car because you've got a family but you want something that can do everything it can take the kids to the football you can put bikes on top of it you can Get it dirty and not really be super precious or care that much about it. But also when you're out in the car yourself and you want to really have a play and have a bit of performance, this car is it. I mean, it does 0 to 60 in 4 seconds flat, which for a light SUV that costs what it costs and how tunable it is, you can easily get this car with a not horrendously large budget for modifications. You could quite easily get this car from... The 500 brake, 450 pound feet of torque, you've got just now 0 to 60 in, you know, however long, 4 seconds. You'd easily have this car at 6, 700 brake with some light modifications and tuning and have this car be able to go a hell of a lot faster. And I reckon you'd genuinely be able to do that for 1,500 quid, 2,000 pounds. It's not a lot of money that you would have to spend to be able to do that. Now, one thing about the X3M that you don't realise and I only really remembered yesterday because Antonio drove past me is you think it doesn't sound that nice being realistic you think it doesn't even sitting in here just now like it, it's loud in here and the cool thing is it doesn't have a soft limiter oh, every car these days has a soft limiter if you're in park it will only go to 4,000 revs and you're just like ah, oh, it just sounds a bit dead Mercedes the worst for it I feel like you can get to about 1,000 revs and then just kill your engine right so you're in here and it's, it sounds loud in here and it's, it's got a bit of shake to it. It's a real aggressive car. But when you're driving, you often think to yourself, oh, this car's just not that loud. Should I take resonators out? Should I take silencers out? But then when you actually go in the car, and I, I don't think it sounds that nice. I, let, me pre, let, let me change what I said there. It sounds awesome when you hear it at full potential. But when we do the sound check in a second, you might think to yourself, uh, it's not that good. If you have someone fly past you in an X3M going full whack, giving it 100% and you hear the car, it sounds absolutely amazing, especially for a straight six. So let's have a little sound check. One thing you'll notice about this car as well is everything's got M Sport accents on it. So all the steering wheels have got it. The stitching on the seats in the back has it. The stitching inside of the steering wheel here has it. Like they obviously love the M Sport design, which I used to think was pretty crap, to be honest. But when you actually get one of these, it's really good. Now it's wet, so I've not got it in the Sport Plus settings just now, especially not just driving about the street. Like I said, it revs so high before it changes gears especially in sport plus so i don't want to be going around a corner that's just revving a bit too high and you slide out a little bit and it's, it's literally not what you mean to do everybody now and then you do a little deliberate slide out you know you decide you want to kick the back side out a little bit maybe you want to do some donuts i'm not saying i have but this car is very capable of donuts which is good um i'm actually going to go through this little industrial estate here this is where I used to come to pick up cable and other such things when I was an electrician, but it's a little 
handy shot. Look up when those lights are red. This gives us the south side, and I know the south side. Once we get on the motorway, I'm gonna I'll put it into Sport Plus because then you've got more space. You're straighter, and you can hear a little bit what it's like. I mentioned this in the SVR video, but I should stop assuming that everybody watches every single one of my videos in complete full length every single time I upload one because I'm not really that interesting. But this is faster than the X, no, not the X, whatever, this is the X, whatever. This is faster than the SVR, not by a considerably huge amount. The power delivery is very different. The SVR in ways feels a lot stronger. Like, in the SVR, I feel like I could pull a tank in the SVR, whereas this just feels like a sports car. So it's quite light and... I'm trying to think of a word, I'm not trying to say the power feels cheap, that's not what I mean, but it feels very, it's just there, the power's just there, but it is faster than the SVR. Now that I think about top speed statistics, the highest speed I've ever had this car at was 168 miles an hour on a private road in Mexico. But that's the fastest I've ever had this car. The Range Rover, I don't think I've had anywhere close to that. Not because I don't think it's capable, but I've just I've just not been in a situation where I've I've done that kind of speed in, in the SVR. So I'm gonna take a stab at this being faster everywhere. It's considerably lighter. Like considerably lighter. You just I can't actually explain how light the steering in this is. Like it's just any little movement you make makes like a considerable difference in how the car moves. And similarly to, to other sport SUVs that I've driven, like SVR, GLS, 63S, Lamborghini, Urus, cars like this, they all are still very good in the comfort mode. Like, this car is so, so, so capable without having to be in Sport Plus all the time. If you are late to merge and you need to pull a little bit just to have some more space to get in or you're having a little play with someone on the motorway or whatever it may be, in comfort mode, this car is still really, really good. And similarly to how I drive my SVR, I would drive this car most of the time in comfort mode in terms of all driving settings with the active exhaust turned on. You get all the benefits of it sounding a little bit nicer without getting the constant whoa, 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 whoa of being in the... There we go. Pulled so hard it shook the freaking gimbal, fellas, right? But this car, sometimes you can feel like when you're in sport mode, the turbo just spools so quickly. It's just you're constantly going, what, 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 and it can get pretty annoying. One thing I will say about this comfort mode, although it is capable, you'll have felt it there. And I believe the setup in this car is that we have one really large turbo and one not quite as large turbo. Um, that's maybe trying to make up for some lag or whatever it may be, or you know, just losing speed in between gears and so on. It spills really, really slowly in comfort mode. Like, I mean, you kick down and you're like insert that Spongebob bit a few moments later that's what it's like you kick down and nothing happens and then all of a sudden you just get a rock up your backside uh, which is pretty fun and I guess at the end of the day it's still I, I think I'm a bit of a delusional tripper when it comes to cars because over the last couple of years I've had so many really 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 fast cars so I forget what is fast and what's a reasonable expectation and all that kind of stuff on to just whilst I'm driving towards the motorway um, maintenance and you know kind of upkeep costs in this car just so you can have an understanding of what it's like when you actually own one of these to service one of these and for clarity I never main dealer service it's not something I've ever really done um, I tend to always go to independence as long as I can still get it stamped so I used to take this car to an independent a service cost me I think 400 quid or so uh, so it's not, it's not a mad expensive car to service. You get a lot of benefits of it being really quick and really enjoyable to use without it being like the McLaren where you're £1,000 for a basic service plus a coolant service, which is 700 quid. And next thing you know, you're £2,000 just for a standard service. So this is pretty reasonable to service. In terms of tyres, you are that standard £450 to £500 a corner, which I think for any performance vehicle... Is, is, is pretty standard just now and I do not grumble spending uh, decent money on tyres like you're never going to hear me complaining about tyres or brakes because at the end of the day those are the things that one make me stop and two have my car attached to the ground 
So if you're wanting a performance car but you don't want to spend money on tyres and you're going to run budget brands and stuff, like get a Yaris or something like that, it's, it's not for you getting a performance car. In terms of insurance, this car is one of the most reasonable to insure that I've ever had. Although the XDM competition hadn't been out all that long when I got this, maybe two years, it's an accessible car in terms of affordability for young men. It's an accessible car in terms of insurance and servicing costs, which also means that because a large amount of them will be driven by young men, a large amount of them will be crashed and written off and stolen when in the possession of young men. So you tend to find that as a car has more data, it will tend to get harder to insure. So across the board in terms of how these finance, filling up a tank of uh, petrol, putting tyres on the car, in comparison to the power you get, the spec you get, like this is one of the best buys you can make. You're going to get, you're going to have so much fun. It's going to do absolutely everything in terms of regardless of where you are in your life. You've got a baby, you've got, you know, two slightly older kids, teenagers, like this, this car is capable of everything, whilst also doing it on a really, really solid budget. Whilst we're waiting to get a little bit of free space on the motorway, ah, oh, as I say that. So capable. So unbelievably capable. One hand. Then you take my hand off the wheel. I don't need to. So you know you've got skills. I'm like Driver Dave, or whatever his name is, DMO DJs, mate. Like, you'll be able to hear how loud that car is through the car, right? Like, I am hoping that through this microphone you've been able to pick up a bit of the cockpit noise there. But see when this car's at full capacity and it's flying past you in the street, the sound is just absolutely incredible. And when you're in that Sport Plus, the power delivery and the downshifting, like how quickly this car downshifts to let you go faster, is absolutely insane. Like, this is what, uh, let me just check, it's a seven speed, no, it's an eight speed, eight speed dual clutch automatic, right? So, this car, I've just banged into manual, so I'm going to take it off manual. Like, this car just knows, it's just amazing technology. When to, like, I lightly tapped the accelerator there. I mean, I did not put an inch of pressure on the accelerator and it downshifted into fourth there. Like, it's just one of those cars, and when you're going, it really wants to rev to, like, five and a half, six thousand revs, and I don't mean under load, I mean just like generally driving, this is me driving as normal, I'm not kicking the arse out of the car, I would, if it was me I'd really be changing gears then now, and it doesn't change, it just stays in the same gear, because it's assuming, oh, I, itchy nose, as always, my grandpa actually said to me the other day, Richard, I've been watching all your videos, you need to sc stop scratching your nose so much, sorry grandpa, I've got an itchy nose, it is what it is, I'm not a drug addict for those of you that are, are wondering, but and because it's in its most aggressive settings just now, like, listen to it downshift there. Like, it downshifts to keep the revs really, really high at all times because it's assuming that you're going to be driving it really hard. Now, I don't want to do my scoring system outside. It gets a little bit cold today. And the funny thing is, I've only used my scoring system once, so I can't actually really remember what I scored it on, right? I'm going to turn this back into comfort settings just now because it actually does annoy me how long it takes to change the gears sometimes. So, let's talk about price for a second, score this car on price, and that's taking everything into consideration. We're going to talk value for money in terms of purchasing the car, not affordability on average, because for everyday mums and dads and, and young men and women, spending, when I bought this car, I paid 50 grand, bang on, £50,000 for this car. It had 15,000 miles on it, uh, was in great shape, that was in 2022, the car was a 69 place, it was two and a half years old, still had warranty, so likely this car's probably 45 or something, so they hold the value really well. So, I'm not saying that that's accessible for everyone, I'm by no means saying that this car is cheap and the average person is just going to walk in and spend £50,000 on a car, that's not true. I'm talking about value for money in terms of what you get for that. So in my opinion, when it comes to maintenance costs, purchasing of the vehicle, how they finance, I have to give this car, I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10, because I think for how usable it is in every aspect of your life, how well they finance, how cheap they are to maintain in comparison to other cars with similar stats, you idiots! People's pull, I'm indicators on and everything, it's not like me, I'm not being, I'm not being some shithead, right, daft old guy. 
So, yeah, I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10 on price. On performance, I am going to give it an 8. Uh, yeah, I'm going to give it an 8. And an 8 is me being very high, right? The things I don't like about this car, and maybe it's because I'm so used to driving my SVR now, is I feel the steering is so light, it's like almost dangerous for me. Like it's so light that I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to move a little bit and it's just going to overturn and like spin or something like that. Which obviously isn't the case. I'm just not driving this car in a, a pretty long time and I'm used to driving something that's a lot heavier. So in terms of performance, the speed you get and whatnot, I, I'm going to give this an 8. It's just, I wish it changed gears a little bit faster. Yes, I can solve that problem by using the manual features and also the flappy paddles. But... I like just letting the car drive for me and just let the car do the work. What were my other scorings? <sighs> Interior quality in this car, I'm going to give it a 7. Not And by the way, 7's really high. For those those people think that like I should be scoring everything 10, 10, 10 all the time. 7 is massively high. But the reason I scored it a 7 and not an 8 and a 9 is because now that I've had the Range Rover interior, I've got a bunch of features that I love in the Range Rover that I don't think I would not want in another car. Heated steering wheel and stuff like that. I really like having those features. I like the double touch screen thing. But for this car, and granted it is like almost five years old now and technology is moving really, really, really fast. I think 7 is an absolutely fantastic score. It is so comfortable. It's so usable. It's so easily serviceable. Everything is really easy to work out. I love the M1 and M2 buttons. I love how it sounds. Everything about the X3M competition is fantastic. If you're looking to make a transition from a hot hatch to something a little bit bigger, you've got a Golf R, you've got an S3, maybe you don't, maybe you've just got a totally normal non-performance car and you want something that you can fit things into, you can do a week of shopping with, it's not going to break the bank to buy it or service it, but you're also going to have an insane amount of fun. The X3M is the ideal car for you. And overall, I'm going to give it a solid 8 out of 10. This car, if it's within your affordability and you want to have something that does absolutely everything all inside of one vehicle, the X3M is absolutely for you.